So just before we get into the BDS vote, I just want to get my audience caught up. This is the vote on July 23rd. This is House Resolution 246, where the House voted to condemn BDS. In that same day, the House passed 1837, which is another AIPAC-endorsed resolution, which authorizes an additional $1 billion increase to Israel for five years, over the next five years, that is, um, for the U.S. War Reserve stockpile. It gives Donald Trump the ability to essentially unilaterally transfer over additional weapons to Israel. There's no stipulations when it comes to human rights. So there's that as well as the BDS vote. So my audience knows where I stand on this. So I just wanted you to be able to kind of give us your take and why you voted to condemn BDS. Sure. Uh, I'll answer the direct question on BDS. But first, let me just put into broader context where I stand on the Israel Palestine relationship. I have uh, called for an end to any new settlement. I've been opposed to uh, demolition of any villages and have written a number of letters uh, calling for Israel to stop the demolition of uh, villages, and I will be leading another letter soon about that issue. Uh, and I have been for lifting the blockade uh, in Gaza uh, to allow for humanitarian aid uh, and economic activity. I uh, also have not supported any effort to penalize or criminalize uh, BDS. So there are a number of laws and resolutions. I think Rubio had one and floating around in the Senate that would actually make it a crime or make it a penalty to do that. What I did vote for is a resolution that said uh, that I disagreed with BDS as a tactic uh, to get peace in the Middle East. And the reason I did that is, one, I think it was it's overbroad to boycott the entire uh, state of uh, Israel. I mean, you're not even targeting uh, settlements. You're targeting the entire state. And I, uh, you know, just like I, I actually, I'm not for usually sanctions. I've been against sanctioning people in Venezuela. Why would why would we public punish collectively uh, an entire uh, country? Uh, I also think it's somewhat selective. Why do uh, Israel and not uh, the oppression of the Uyghurs in China, a million people who are being oppressed, or Saudi Arabia, where there's huge oppression in the Yemen war? So I, uh, I, I, I think there is absolutely uh, suffering and abuses with the Palestinians, but I don't think that calls for the boycott of an entire country. And finally, I think culturally, I mean, when you walk onto the House floor, the first uh, statue you see o- overlooking the entire house is uh, uh, Moses, the lawmaker. And I just think that culturally uh, recognizing the relationship with Israel and then moving them uh, into a direction, a more progressive direction, a direction of human rights, a direction of peace, uh, is uh, a more effective strategy to, to get uh, to the, the goal of a two-state solution and a Palestinian state. So let me ask you this, because I don't I don't agree with um, what you said, but I can I can understand your position. And I think that some of your points, you know, in terms of why single out Israel, I think that that is persuasive to a lot of people. But this is what I would like to know, if not BDS, you know, this is a Palestinian led peaceful movement, if not BDS, what can we do to put pressure on Israel to end this occupation, to actually get peace, to get them to recognize Palestinian human rights? Because it seems like BDS is really the one thing that has gotten the attention of U.S. lawmakers, of, you know, the Netanyahu government. So this seems like it can work. So, I mean, if you're against BDS, what do you think we're able to do as U.S. citizens, as allies to the Palestinian people, to um, stop the suffering, essentially? Well, I'm not sure it has worked. I mean, I, I would argue that Netanyahu has committed more abuses uh, and been more destructive to peace uh, than probably any other of his uh, recent predecessors. And now partly I think the Trump administration has enabled that. But I don't think you can argue that the situation start with the BDS movement has led to a a more peaceful outcome. Uh, Maybe one day it will, but certainly the facts on the ground don't suggest to me right now uh, that it has achieved the uh, the ends. I think what has achieved ends in the past 
has been when presidents, whether it was Dwight Eisenhower uh, going back to uh, the, the, the crisis with, uh, with the Sinai Peninsula or uh, Ronald Reagan or George Bush Sr. Uh, or Bill Clinton, at all different times, they uh, said that uh, whether it was conditional loans or certain forms of United States assistance, they said, look, we, we reserve the right uh, uh, to suspend that, or we reserve the right to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to block that if uh, you don't comply with uh, the framework that uh, the United States has set forward. And we, it's, that's not a novel idea. That's something American presidents have done going back, as I said, to Eisenhower. And so I would say that you need a president who will articulate a clear vision, stop the settlement growth. Uh, get to the peace table, uh, lift the blockade and the demolitions, and be willing to uh, uh, to leverage uh, our uh, extraordinary role there to get get that uh, done. Well, when it comes to the effect- effectiveness of BDS, I think that you can argue that it has been effective in some ways and it hasn't been effective in others. But I think that what really is important about this is the Palestinian people, they modeled this after the apartheid boycott, you know, in South Africa. And even though that wasn't necessarily in and of itself the one thing, the one catalyst that ended apartheid, it was a crucial tool to ending oppression. So I'm just, I just feel like, you know, when we are emphasizing peace, peaceful resistance, BDS is essentially the one tool that Palestinians have. So if we essentially take that away from them and we tell American allies that they also shouldn't participate in that and there may be, you know, penalties in the United States, then I just don't feel like there's much that we're leaving in terms of actually putting pressure on Israel who is the occupier, and there's this imbalance of power. So it feels as if, you know, the situation is already hopeless, but when you remove BDS, when you have U.S. lawmakers voting to condemn it, and in some instances criminalize it in multiple states, it just, it feels like we're in this never-ending hopeless situation where this will always be the status quo. Now, I don't think that you and I will see eye to eye when it comes to the issue of BDS, but there is one area where I think that we can kind of put our disagreements to rest. And it was something that you said with regard to the criminalization. So individually, you disagree with BDS. However, you did state that you are against the criminalization of BDS. Is that correct? The criminalization or civil fines. I'm against any um, statutory penalty for engaging in BDS. I have uh, no desire, nor do I think it's appropriate for the United States government uh, to interfere with what any citizen wants to do uh, in uh, their protest. I just think as a lawmaker whose goal ultimately is to try to uh, see uh, a resolution of peace in that area, uh, that I may have a different perspective uh, than a citizen uh, in a different sense of where I think w- will be most effective for the peace process. People may disagree with me, but that's my personal opinion. But I, I certainly don't think I, we, I have the right, uh, as a, or, or we have a right as a state, to penalize people for engaging in uh, protests. And I refuse uh, last term, uh, I never co sponsored or supported the BDS bills that. Uh, uh, APEC was supporting uh, that a number, many other of my colleagues, if you go look at who all supported those bills, there were a lot of people who supported the uh, the, the penalty or criminalization of BDS. I never did. And, you know, that really, it does make a difference, right? We don't have to necessarily agree, but so long as, you know, you are using your power and platform as a lawmaker to not criminalize it, that is important. So let me ask you this. Since you are against the criminalization, can we count on your support for House Resolution 496? This is sponsored by Ilhan Omar, and this quote affirms that all Americans have the right to participate in boycotts in pursuit of civil and human rights at home and abroad as protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. This is something that actually, after Tulsi Gabbard and Ayanna Presley had voted with you to condemn BDS, they signed on to this bill. So can we count on you to do the same? I have not uh, co-sponsored that bill for the simple reason that I think it's self-evident. I mean, I don't, I don't know why we need to 
affirm the right that's constitutionally protected. Uh, I support the principle. I support, and what you can count on me on is that I will never in my public career vote uh, to criminalize or penalize a boycott against any country, including our own. Uh, but I, I think that's a violation of the Constitution, and I think uh, a law is redundant. I, I told that to Ilhan when she asked me about it. And it is, like I agree with you, it is self-evident, and this really is something that we shouldn't have to do. We shouldn't have to affirm that U.S. citizens have the right to protest and engage in political activity that the government may or may not deem as inappropriate. But unfortunately, that's not the reality currently when we have 25-plus states that actually penalize people who don't sign these anti-BDS Israeli loyalty pledges. I mean, there's a Texas school teacher who was fired, and she's now suing because she was forced to either sign a loyalty pledge to Israel or lose her job. So I feel like at this day and age, when lawmakers are voting to condemn BDS, it really is important to affirm that support. So I'm hoping that you're not entirely, you know, your mind is made up here. I mean, I'm I'm open. I'll I'll take another look. I mean, the initial reason I haven't, and because other people have asked me, is I just think it's a... It's a constitutional principle, and I, I guess I don't see what, uh, uh, unless we're going to pass something, uh, what the value, it's almost diminishing the constitutional protection. What I would be happy to do is sign on to an amicus brief uh, for someone suing uh, in one of these states, uh, and if it's going to the Supreme Court to support uh, someone's right to, uh, to, to, to boycott, I'd be happy to support legislation that said, that the states need to remove uh, these restrictions. Um, but to affirm a federal constitutional right legislatively, I think, is actually to, uh, to to diminish that right. It'd be like if someone said, let's pass a statute to affirm Roe versus Wade. I mean, we wouldn't do that because it's a constitutional right. I mean, that's my that was my perspective on it. But but in terms of the commitment, it's a it's 100% there, uh, and you can hold me to it. We're, we're being recorded. That in the entire course of my public career, I will always stand up for people's right to boycott and uh, and, the, and the government shouldn't be uh, ever penalizing that. But on one hand, you know, you voted to condemn BDS, but now it seems contradictory that you won't vote to affirm our right to engage in BDS. So do you kind of see why it seems as if there's this double standard? And again, I, I think that the fact that you're willing to say, I will not support the criminalization is important that goes you know a long way but to take it a step further and say not only do i not condone the criminalization but i affirm the right to protest it just it may be symbolic but i think that it would demonstrate to people that you're really committed to stopping any efforts to curtail freedom of speech i hear that uh, i i don't think uh, a singular bill is the only way to do that. I think I can make the constitutional argument for that, and there'll be numerous cases. I, I've made that case, and uh, if you talk to constituents in my uh, own uh, district, that I said I would vigorously oppose any efforts in California to criminalize uh, a BDS or penalties, and I uh, can be active uh, uh, in in doing that in other states. I, I'm not. I'm I'm open to uh, when I get back uh, after recess to. to uh, to looking at the bill, but I, uh, but I am a hundred percent committed to affirming the the right to uh, a, a boycott for Broadway. Well, thank you for being open. Um, I really, I do appreciate the fact that you're being open. And unlike other other lawmakers, when you say that you're open, I genuinely believe that you are open. So thank you, and I just really hope that you do consider that bill. Um, one more time, that is HR. 496, sponsored by Ilhan Omar for viewers who don't know.